material lie. A material lie is an intentionally false statement that impacts the outcome. Okay? A material, a material lie is something that impacts the outcome. The doc says, we, I wouldn't have put that person on TTD for that long. The carrier says, we wouldn't have paid that. We would have handled this differently. I would have billed their private insurance carrier instead of their workers' comp carrier. That's material. Zip codes, weight, yes ladies, your weight is not material. Um, <laughs> hair color, not either. Those are not material. Material lies are those things that would have impacted the outcome. Okay? How strong must the evidence of fraud be to warrant criminal filing? It's not. I had some guys say that's an impossible standard. No, it's not. But think of yourselves as jurors. Is the evidence strong enough where you think that you and 11 of your closest friends would be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt? In order for us to file a criminal case, I have to be convinced that the evidence is so strong that there is a reasonable probability that a jury of 12 will all agree to what that evidence proves, okay? Yeah. Now, some of you may think, well, that's ridiculous, except it happens every day in the county of Los Angeles, in Orange County and Riverside, throughout this country. And it's a glorious system because it gets it right most of the time, but I am looking at the strength of the evidence, and that's not any one piece of evidence, which brings me to my next question, which is, what is it that makes for a successful criminal case? Compelling evidence. And compelling evidence is evidence that is corroborated, which goes back to our reports, right? Because corroboration can be anything that tends in reason to support a given fact. It's paper mache. How many, how many of us have done paper mache projects with our children, right? And when they start off, what do they look like? They look like a hot mess, right? <laughs> and as you add layers, all of a sudden the thing, whatever it is, starts to take shape. Corroboration is exactly the same thing. What you see in the workplace may be corroborative. What another worker knows about. What somebody posts on their Facebook page. What somebody wrote on their blotter. What one person sees corroborative of a given fact. Which takes me back to my rule that I announced before that I have learned to live with, which is if it isn't written down, it didn't happen. If you know something, write it down. If you have a suspicion, write it down. It is a lot easier for us in court to say, tell me, Captain, why is it that you recall that incident from six years ago? Well, you know, at the time, it struck me as being weird, so I wrote it down on a piece of paper. Okay, that helps us out, because in addition to also have to understand that it's going to be subject to the scrutiny of jurors who are going to say, does that make sense? Because corroboration is what helps people use their common sense. Okay? Do cases ever get filed? I get this from a lot of adjusters in SIUs. Yes, they do, but keep in mind, they're gonna be vetted through a number of different sources, not only through the investigators, but also through the DAs, and then they bring them to me, at least in my county, and I look at them, and we talk about how the evidence is gonna play and what we can do. Do we need it gift wrapped in a Tiffany box? No, we do not, but we wanna be sure that whatever we walk into court with is strong. Why? Because what goes into court is the best representation of what it is that really is out there. And we want to make sure that what we're demonstrating to the public is we're doing strong investigations, we're doing good investigations, and we're getting it right once the first time. But I was um, intimately involved. I shepherded the Bell prosecution. I got that case in June. We filed it in September. Believe me, if I had been interested in solving all of the curiosity questions and answering all of my in eight questions about what was going on in Bell and why, we'd probably still be investigating it and we wouldn't have six convictions. Okay, that's not the way it's working in the LADA's office. We may not answer every question that somebody has. We have sufficient evidence to prove whatever charges are appropriate, which takes us to the Al McKinsey approach. The LADA's office still utilizes that approach because ultimately our goal is to take bad actors out of play. What that means in terms of county vendors, for instance, is we're broadening the scope of the charges that we file. We're not just filing fraud charges, we're also filing grand theft charges. Why? Because if a contractor enters a bid for, say, janitorial services, and they say, we're gonna clean all those buildings for $100,000, and they underbid everybody else, and they get the bid, but it turns out that the reason they were able to bid that is because they pay everybody cash they don't pay workers comp, they don't pay that other stuff, then I can file grand theft because they lied when they got the contract. And when I file grand theft, not only do they have to pay for the premiums that they didn't pay, they have to return every cent they got under the contract. 
So now instead of being a hundred and fifty or two hundred thousand dollar case, it may be a million dollar case if they've gotten a lot of contracts to clean a lot of buildings. That also means that person's going to be disqualified as a vendor. Who does that help? That helps the other businesses that may have competed, and it helps all of us as, as citizens of the county. So those are the kinds of things that we're doing to broaden the scope to be sure that the bad behavior isn't tolerated. For people in other forms of insurance fraud that we might not be able to make the case, we're looking at the tax consequences. Because trust me, if there's anything you don't want, it's having the FTB follow you around. They are relentless, and their rules are much more general. So tax fraud is, in some circumstances, an easier way to take out a bad player, and it has the same <coughs> net result. So do cases ever get filed? Yes, they do, but sometimes it's a long process. Have faith and a little patience. Here's the big question. Does anybody ever really get punished? Sometimes. AB 109 is realignment, and under realignment, the only people that are eligible for state prison are those who commit acts of violence, and fraud is not within that. The exception is for cases that are $100,000 or more. There can be jail sentences, or local, it's called local prison, for people who commit fraud under $100,000, but that means that they go to the county jail, and then it becomes a matter of administration by our local sheriff as to whether or not they're going to stay there. And in the triage that the sheriff faces, sometimes it's more important to keep gang members in than people who commit white-collar crime. Don't think for a moment that the white-collar criminals, especially those that are involved in syndicates, don't know that. Can we change that? Not immediately. But we can make it so cost-prohibitive that we have an impact. And that's where broadening the scope of the charges that we file comes into play. Because if a bad guy is saying, listen, <coughs> if I don't pay the insurance, if I don't pay workers' comp and I pay everybody under the table and I save that 40%, what are the chances of my getting caught? And if I get caught, if all I have to do is pay the premium, what the hell, then it's a good business decision. If on the other hand, not only do you have to pay the premium, but you have to pay back all the money that you got, we've now expanded that case so that now it becomes cost prohibitive. It is an unfortunate circumstance that we face, and we're doing the best we can. We recently uh, pled a case out, and I, we couldn't come up with a really good punishment aspect, so we found one. And that person's doing 1,200 hours of Caltrans. 1,200 hours of cleaning the freeway. <laughs> Victory for us. Because that's 12 hundred hours that they won't be spending doing other scams. So we're trying using the circumstances, in the circumstances that we have. Will people go to state prison? Only in large cases. Is it an outcome that we want? No, but it's what we're faced with. Trust me when I tell you we understand the absence of punishment can create a positive environment for criminals, but we're doing what we can under the law. Do you work in any capacity with the Office Inspector General for Medicare? We interface, in fact, I just got a case from HHS. We interface with my federal partners, as well as my partners at the Attorney General's office, to try to see who's in the best position to be able to handle this. Anybody on the state side, though, is stuck with AB 109. What are we doing to battle these cases? We're continuing to our outreach with stakeholders. And as David said, that goes beyond county lines. And if I can't help you or David can't help you, we will find, find our counterparts. I'm interfacing with them on a regular basis. This is a cooperative effort. You know, some people believe in isolationism, I do not. We have increased our collaboration with other law enforcement agencies. I'm working with tax agencies. I'm working with other prosecution agencies. I'm working with investigative agencies. We're working with private industry. We will take information from anywhere. We don't care where the information comes from so long as we The other thing that I'm doing is I'm working very hard to try to prevent growing fraud. There is a, there is a large growth of Thank you. Of, uh, there's an expansion in the use of electronic signing, uh, electronic signatures. The evidence code is 30 years behind the times. So I am working currently with the California District Attorneys Association to create legislation so that we can get into court with those people that are using the internet as a way of perpetrating crime. As it stands right now, non-wet signatures are very hard to prosecute, and we lose cases because we can't identify the bad guy. Keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, anytime I prosecute a crime, I can't charge a company, 
I can't charge an entity. I need a picture of a defendant in the defendant. Other means for us to pursue companies, and we do that through our Consumer Protection Division for unfair business practices. But my job is to find the crooks. And in order to prosecute a crook, I need a name and a picture. So help me do that by letting us know what it is that's going on, what it is that you see. Err on the side of reporting. I'd rather hear from you too much than not enough. Is there anyone you can talk to about this? The answer on the bottom of this is an uncategorical, absolute yes. Call me, text me, write me, email me, or Captain Goldberg. Since he's been kind enough to offer it up. I'm dead serious about this. I, if I can't handle it, I will find a place for it. I will tell you on the front end if you have any doubts whether or not it sounds like something that ought to be reported. Err on the side of contact because until we make greater inroads on this and until we can have a broader impact, there are going to be segments of our society that are going to capitalize on what is largely an honor system. Democracy is based upon honor. Democracy is based upon truth and justice. And so for those of us that really believe in the system, we have to do battle and understand that there is no acceptable lie. This notion of saying, well, it's okay because it was only a little lie, is not okay. There are administrative things that you can do and I would encourage you to do to drop this tolerance of lies. And if it's a material lie, make my day, send me an email, and we'll go after it. Thank you for your time and attention. I wish you a glorious new year and a happy holiday season. Thank you for having me.